In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Please be seated. So this gentleman looking rather disgruntled after uh, the church service gets up and walks to the back as everyone is greeting the preacher on the way out the door and he waits his turn and he goes and he shakes hand with the preacher and he says to him, you really have to work on your preaching. Every time I come, it's the exact same message. A little defensively, the preacher says to the person, but you only come on Easter day. <laughs> so whether this is your home every time the doors are unlocked or whether this is your home on these, the holiest of holy days, one, we are incredibly glad you're here. Um, and two, I feel the same way sometimes. Like you've heard everything that I have to say about resurrection. But that's not going to stop me. Sorry. <laughs> and largely because I don't just believe it's about hearing. I believe it's about living resurrection. So, I have another confession to make. When the Capitals, you remember last May and June, the Capitals went deep into the playoffs and won their first ever Stanley Cup. I have to confess that I became an enormous fan, but before they eliminated uh, the Pittsburgh Penguins, I probably could only name two players on the team. Uh, but by the end, I was as rabid a fan as anybody. Uh, but that isn't the case with this uh, University of Virginia basketball team. <laughs> you knew I was gonna drop it in. and. and and it's only one story, which took a lot of restraint on my part. So I was all in from the beginning. I told folks, even after they were losing to Duke, you know what, I don't care how far this team goes, they are special. They have bought in hook, line, and sinker to what this coach is teaching them. And they are remarkable young men who believe in each other and play as a team. And I have just loved watching them play. It didn't bother me that they got all the way to the championship and won the national title. Uh, it didn't bother me so much, in fact, that the next Saturday I went to Charlottesville uh, with 20-some uh, other thousand people who it didn't bother too much that they won the national title. And we celebrated their winning the championship. Uh, and they went, and uh, during all of the celebrations, they interviewed all of the players, and they saved uh, Ty Jerome, our point guard, for last. And, if there's anyone on our team who struggles even a little bit with humility, uh, it may be him. He's the point guard. He's supposed to be the most brash. You want that in a point guard. Uh, and the uh, MC was sort of egging him on a little bit. He said, people haven't believed in you from the time you arrived here. They didn't believe that your style of basketball could win a championship. They didn't believe you were athletic enough. Uh, that you were a strong enough team leader, uh, that this system would ever win a championship. How did it feel to stick it to all of them? How did it feel to get the last laugh, to win the national title, and prove all of those naysayers wrong? And Ty Jerome said, like he hadn't thought about it once. That's, that's not what this was about. I played every minute for the people the men standing behind me. I played for the university, and I played because played I love basketball. What does this day mean? Why did Father Ben tell that story? Just because he wanted to get that uh, you know, mo moment in? Uh, no. <laughs> because I think there is something that we have to dig in deep to understand. Why did Jesus rise from the dead? Was it to prove to Rome and to all who ever held power and lorded it over the other that there's a power greater than them? Was it to be able to wag his finger and say, I've got the last laugh? Nothing is more powerful than God. I don't believe that's what this is about. I don't believe this is about one man, however divine this one man might be. I don't believe this was about one empire and one moment in time some thousands of years ago. I think one of the reasons we're here is that we need to widen and push back the understanding of what resurrection means. 
Richard Rohr wrote in a meditation uh, that the church has sort of gone in divergent paths uh, ever since the split in uh, uh, about the 11th century between the East and uh, the Western church. And he said the Eastern church often, even in their art, uh, displays the resurrection uh, with Jesus by himself, often with a white flag as the hero uh, and the victor in the moment, rising up in victory. In the West, it's much different in art. Uh, it's often uh, Jesus holding up and bringing up all of those uh, uh, tormented by hell, closing and defeating hell forever, and raising up all humanity. The shackles and the chains uh, all fallen by the wayside as Jesus in the resurrection lifts up all humanity. I think I need that truth. Not just that one person who happened to also be divine, uh, who would ascend up into heaven some 40 days later, defeated death. But that resurrection is my story. Because selfishly, if it's my story, I pay a whole lot more attention, and it resonates a lot more deeply. And I need resurrection to be my story. I can walk outside those doors pretend that today didn't happen and it didn't happen some 2,000 years ago and all the things that occur in the world, good or bad, are just happenstance. Uh, but I know that leaves me rudderless. I know I need this truth to be my truth, to be the abiding identity of the universe, that every suffering, every death, every broken moment is there for God to redeem is an Easter potential moment. I need to have that kind of confidence and that kind of bold, absolute rigor towards resurrection. I need to have willful, stubborn resurrection. Especially as I wake up today, and even at the day where it's as easy as any day to make Alleluia our song, to say the Lord is risen indeed, alleluia. I turn on my phone and I go to those uh, news updates and I see that over 200 people have lost their lives on Easter Day. Many sitting in a pew like you are saying, alleluia, Christ is risen. From those people sitting in the pews in Sri Lanka to us sitting in the pews here today, we have a choice. Do we still make Alleluia our song? Do we still make resurrection our truth? And do we bend our lives towards that reality? I can think of no other way forward. There's a story in 1799, as Austria is being invaded by Napoleon and his forces, this small town uh, already knowing the power of Napoleon and already knowing uh, that they don't have the manpower to be able to push them back, gather to figure out what to do. And as they're arguing and wrestling over uh, how they might be able to, uh, to survive this, the dean of the cathedral says, tomorrow's Easter. We've tried everything that human strength can try. All I can suggest is that we do what we do as Easter people. We go to church, we ring the bells, and we proclaim that Christ is risen. And they did. And they did. And when those bells pealed, Napoleon's forces were convinced that this was a sign that reinforcements had come in uh, and that their numbers were great enough to defeat uh, France's, and so France retreated. I wish every story ended that way. But every story can have that component. Every story can be imbued with people who make Easter their song, their bold proclamation, the heart of their life. Third century mathematician said that, you know, if you give me something that holds, some foundation that I know is true beyond any matter of fact, if you give me that foundation, 
From there, I can move the world. I can change the universe. This is our foundational truth, that Christ is risen, that Christ raised all humanity with him, and that every death, not just the death that we talked about on Friday, but every Good Friday moment is ripe for redemption and for a new hope. If we make that our foundation, anything is possible. All the way through this journey that we started on Ash Wednesday, I've talked about these three images that have led me through. One, those ashes that were smudged on our forehead. Those ashes, the sign of the cross now becomes a reminder that that dust, that finite particle that makes us up, is no longer all we are. We are more than what will ever go away. We are promised eternity with God. That other image of us being these earthen vessels, filled with a treasure that is beyond all measure. We have the opportunity when we take this truth that we are Easter people and we walk out those doors, we can shine a light through all of the cracks that the world has. And we can point to something beyond ourselves. That God has not given up on us. That nothing is beyond hope. That that hope shines like the lights through the cracks into the world. And finally, like the bread of the Eucharist, that bread from the grains and elements of the earth becomes something that always points beyond itself. It always points to that heavenly banquet where all of us are promised a place. Could our lives be such? Could we walk out these doors and make our lives always point beyond the current situation? Always point to that abiding truth in the universe that Christ is risen, that Christ is raising all things up in him, and that all things will be made new. Can we make our song the same song that we said as we walked into these doors? And I find it helpful uh, at 8 o'clock that you have the bulletin when I give you this prompt, and we say that opening sentence together so much so that they can hear it down the street. Alleluia! Christ is risen! Lord is risen. Amen.